Welcome back to Las Vegas. We're here live in the Sugar Cane, and I'm really pleased to have Sanjeev Mohan, who is the founder and principal analyst at Sanjmo, his own firm. He's a, he's a, he's a collaborator of the Cube Collective. It's great to yeah. see you. Thank We're you. here all, all, well, all week at reInvent. We're here just today at the Sugar Cane, MongoDB at the, the Emerald Lounge, we're yeah. calling this, right? They give us a nice in-kind contribution so we could do our editorial. And I'm really excited to talk to you about your impressions so far of, of reInvent. Uh, we're going to get into some of the details around the data platform. Yeah. Uh, we haven't talked much today about zero ETL, something that was announced last year. Sounds like it's finally coming to help uh, it's the simplify the pipeline. Yeah, it's and, uh, and I want to talk about Mongo and what they're doing with, uh, with, with vector search yeah. and what the impact is going to be on the market. So first, your impressions on the overall event. Uh, it's very positive. I think this has been an amazing event up to this point. A lot of announcements. In fact, you know, we've been doing a lot of one-on-ones with a product team. Right. If I, literally, if I talk about Redshift, just on Redshift there could be a whole keynote. Yeah. That's true. Uh, you know, there, there are things that are not even mentioned. For example, you know, we learned today that on Amazon uh, S3, which was one of the very first surveys way back in 2006, a new instance class was introduced, a storage class called Single Zone, which is like 10x faster than S3 standard. But what was not mentioned was S3 has something called access grants. Uh, which uh, do very low level fine grain access control at S3 level. Not even mentioned, nobody's mentioned it because there are so many announcements. It's like a bat phone to S3. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so we are, uh, you know, if you start looking into the details, Amazon has really, really innovated uh, across, uh, everybody wants to hear Gen AI, but it's across the stack. So. Well, okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about the data platform. Yeah. Uh, I mean, essentially you have, and Amazon's leaning in to their strategy of many different tools, yes. the right tool for the right job, many Correct. different data, data stores. Yeah. How do they bring that all together yeah. uh, in a way that they have business metadata, operational metadata, uh, uh, technical metadata, yeah. so that these co-pilots, or in their case, Q, right. Yeah. can operate and take action right. uh, so they can make sure that the, the semantics are coherent yeah. and consistent. Right. How do they do that? I, I, we haven't seen that. It's not here today. Nope, nope right. it's not here. Do they have to focus on that? I, yes, in fact we have asked AWS that question and they don't think that's needed because they're, they're going through an integration strategy. Let me give you an example. DynamoDB is a hugely successful extreme scale key value data store. Uh, DynamoDB is used uh, hugely. Every yeah. time you go on Zoom and you log in as DynamoDB. We use DynamoDB. CrowdChat runs on DynamoDB. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Amazon.com, there's so yeah. much. So, MongoDB has introduced vector embeddings inside the, the JSON document. DynamoDB does similar stuff but instead of putting vector database or vector embedding inside DynamoDB, they have actually extended zero ETL to open source. Open source, as you know, is an open source version of Elastic, which already has inverted search. Now it has vectors, so you can even do semantic search. Right, so. But it's configuration. There's no, you don't have to do anything because it's zero ETL. Okay, so the zero ETL they announced last year for Aurora to Redshift. Aurora, right? MySQL. Aurora MySQL, which Aurora, Aurora is MySQL, right? But it's not Aurora Postgres and Aurora MySQL. Right, This okay. year they did Aurora Postgres. And? And uh, Dynamo, DynamoDB. And RDS. And R uh, yes, RDS, MySQL. MySQL. Yes. Okay, so. Yeah. What does that mean for customers that are running a data pipeline yeah. where they're doing a lot of ETLing, a lot of standing around waiting, Correct. a lot of wrangling of data, what does that mean for them? Yeah, so, so what it means is if you, uh, we just talked about DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is uh, literally the way you get to DynamoDB is by doing gets and puts. 
if you want to do a data warehouse kind of an aggregation. Object store. Yeah, how do you do uh, that? But now with zero ETL, it yeah. becomes easier because now you can do into Redshift, no, no uh, just configuration and it's done for you and all of a sudden now you, your data is available in Redshift for aggregations. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's see, um, I want to ask you about your criteria that you wrote, you, you did a Medium post, um, and you were talking about the various criteria to evaluate uh, AI generally, but specifically uh, vector, vector database. Yeah. And that functionality. Mongo, they haven't announced the general availability yet, but Correct. they announced vector search. Yes. It was amazing to see uh, the survey mm -hmm. from... Uh, Retool. From, from Retool. Retool, yep. Which showed, it was toward, toward the end, yeah. it showed 20% of 1,400 respondents uh, actually were deploying vector yeah. databases. We were one, I was actually thrilled yeah. to see this, such a low yeah. number. We didn't take that survey, but well, maybe we did, not yeah. 20 But Mongo yeah. was the, along with Pinecone, was the yeah. most deployed, yeah. and the, the NPS on Mongo was much, much, much higher. Right. I was shocked yep. by that. So my question is, first of all, were you surprised by that, number one? Number two is, does it make sense for customers to just, that are, that are Mongo customers, to, to consolidate yeah. onto the Mongo search, and what do they lose by doing so? So I, I'll ask you a hypothetical, like I'll ask you a rhetorical question. Okay. How much do you think the vector search capability of MongoDB costs? I, I hope it's free. It's free. Yeah. Uh, why is it free? Because it is not a skew. Pinecone right. is an entire product. Many database vendors are selling vector search as a separate capability. And I think this is where MongoDB really shines because- We use Milvis, it's yeah. open source. Correct. But, and I don't think we pay for the, the Zilla's service. Right, right. But we so, probably could or should yeah, yeah. much rather use Atlas. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, so you know the, the beauty of what MongoDB, and I, I'm not proposed, I'm not like a spokesperson for MongoDB, I'm just saying that MongoDB has, a, has some very distinct advantages because their foundational database is really strong. For example, uh, they introduced uh, earlier on the separation of search nodes. So you can you know, do separation of concern, you don't overload. So you can scale you as can well. Scale. Yeah. yeah, now the vector search can sit on search node. Yeah. So, so they're getting a lot of these advantages uh, for free. So whatever Extending goes. Extending the value of the core platform. Correct, yeah. Without having to produce a standalone, separate, like a SKU, it's just, it, so you know, the multi-region distribution, you get it out of the box. So I think MongoDB has that advantage. But do, do, so. do, you, do you lose something? I mean, presumably if I'm a, if I had to make the case for a, a, a standalone vector database, right. I'd say all, all the committers in the open source community yeah. or all the, the value, or they are, all the R&D goes into right. just that. So right. we have a better, you say the same thing about time series databases yeah. and graph databases, Correct. right? As opposed to sort of yeah. making it part of a, a, a general purpose, right. not that Mongo's general purpose, but let's call it such. Yeah. Um, what do I lose? by applying that. So, I, you know, I don't think you lose anything. The reason I'm saying that is because you, you mentioned graph database. If you have your data in a graph database, how do you move it to a different database? You cannot. Graph, the, one of the reasons why graph databases have struggled is because there is no good graph data interchange format like JSON. Yeah. MongoDB uses BSON, which is, mm -hmm. you know, binary version of JSON. So, so if you have vector embedding, in a JSON, uh, it's not too hard to move it, right? Yeah, yeah, because okay. it's JSON. So why not? It's also hard to query graph mm -hmm. databases. Mm -hmm. But okay, so you're an analyst. Yeah. I would presume you wouldn't be advising investors to invest in a standalone vector database company. Yeah, I, you know, I, <laughs> I think uh, time will tell, but I, I don't see any reason for standalone vector databases uh, unless you have a very specific uh, use case. By the way, I do have to say, graph data uh, model uh, has been incorporated into other uh, databases, but you still have Neo4j, 
yeah. and uh, which is the market leader. So it's quite possible in vector database, there might be one or two specialized ones that make it, but for the vast use cases, it may get incorporated. Have you looked at relational AI? Yes, what do you very think much. Of, what do you think about what they're doing? I, so relational AI uh, is, is actually, at Snowflake, they did an amazing demo of taking the snow, they're running inside Snowflake container. Right. They take Snowflake data, they convert it into, uh, into graph database with relational access. You just said the big problem with Hard graph to query. is query. This makes it easy to query. You could have yes. the flexibility of SQL yeah. with the expressiveness of a graph database Correct. combined. Yes. That seems like it's very powerful. Does yeah. it work to your knowledge? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow, so yeah. that could be, yeah. that could portend to yeah. support future data apps yep. that are intelligent. So Correct. that's kind of interesting. Speaking of uh, vector embeddings, mm -hmm. so Adam Slipsky talked about Q today, which is yes. essentially their co-pilot, yep. and he said the semantic knowledge, or maybe it was Matt Wood, I think it was Matt Wood, said the semantic knowledge is, comes via vector embeddings. Yes. Okay, makes sense. You, yeah, you need it, yeah. But, are those vector embeddings, yeah. are, are, how, how do you take advantage of those in different, different data stores across Amazon, are they separate for each? Is they're, there? they're separate, okay. yeah. So that's the problem we started to talk Correct. about earlier. Yeah. They, do they have to address that problem? You're saying that Amazon d doesn't think that it has to solve that right. problem. So this is how they solved it. It's actually, it's a brilliant use case. What they're saying is, let's say you are in Aurora. Okay. And, uh, and you want to do uh, any use case of LLM. It could be summarization, sentiment analysis, so what they're saying is, what you do is you create a user-defined function that you, in, so the developer will do it, not the end user doesn't need to know that. The user-defined function is going to make an API call to SageMaker Jumpstart, which is a model garden, if you may, of, yeah. or of, uh, of Titan, which is their model, and, and a bunch of hugging face, Cohere, Anthropic, all of that. So you make an API call, and it returns back what you asked for, sentiment analysis. So now you are saying, here is my user-defined function, I do sentiment analysis on this column, and uh, without having to do vector embeddings inside Aurora MySQL, you've done that wrong trip. So, so this is, I, there's a very interesting example I learned today. Uh, in, in a country like India, for instance, there are diff, uh, dozens of languages. Dozens of languages. Yeah, yeah, just inside, right. Yeah, just, just in one country. country. So if you're a loan origination officer and you get some document in a local language, you can call an LLM and say translate it into English. And they'll do it out of the box. So I think this is a strategy they are pursuing, which is through SageMaker, so Redshift ML, Aurora ML, and that way, it's a, it's a different thing. How many languages do you speak? <laughs> I think about four or five. Have yeah. you, have you yeah. tested the efficacy of the translation? Uh, not yet. No. No. Yeah. We, you know, we play yeah. a lot with the Cube yeah. AI and the translations. They're still, yeah. Yeah. they're okay. Yeah. You know, they're, they're not, I, and that's for P9 languages. I wonder how they do yeah. in, in so, India. So we had a, a panel with Travelers, and uh, Travelers Insurance CIO, Yep. was telling us how uh, they are, uh, they've got claims and policy and how they're bringing it together using LLM. So I asked her two questions. One was, how do you guarantee accuracy? And she said, we have to have a human in the loop right now. The human in the loop will, will say yes, correct or not, and if it's not, then they correct it. That's accuracy. My second question to her was, so what is the ROI? Are you seeing any benefit? And she said if it takes, let's say, X amount of time, yeah. and they're seeing that time come down, That's ROI. instant ROI, instant. Yeah, yeah and I, I don't have a problem with human in the loop, yeah. as long as you can get that compression Correct. in time, which Correct. is exactly what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. What do you want to see, last question, because I know you got to go, what do you want to see from AWS that you haven't seen at this event? I think it's, uh, they need to continue on the simplification. Like, uh, we spent an inordinate amount of time yesterday, when you were there, yeah. and, and this morning, on silicon. Yeah. You know, 
Influentia 2, Graviton 4, Trinium uh, 2, and uh, even Adam Silipsky said, we have an advantage over all other cloud providers, they haven't even started. Well, that's not true. Yeah, it's not true. You know, so so I, I think he said that a lot in the keynote today. Yeah, you know, this is the only place you can get this. Yeah. It's like, well, we are on fourth generation in our fifth year, and others are, have not even started. I think uh, there is just too much emphasis on the nuts and bolts and building blocks, and I still don't see enough on uh, the business use case side. So. Interesting, I mean, but that is their sweet spot, is the yes. infrastructure. Right. And we had, we had yeah. I don't know, did you see the Peter DeSantis keynote last no, night? No, I, I, I Well, you go. missed 20 minutes on, uh, on synchronizing clocks across. Oh, I heard about know, it. Which, I mean, yeah. Google Spanner solved that 10 years ago, and I yeah. mean, Global Sysplex as well. So, yeah, <laughs> that 20 was minutes? Easily, 20? easily, wow. easily 20 minutes. So there's a lot It was of interesting, for those of us who care yeah. about such a thing, yeah. but it was educational, I should say. So talking about that? Too much time. Yeah, <laughs> we also learned that six or so low uh, Earth orbit satellites have been launched, six of them. Yeah. You know, Keeper, K-U-I-P-E-R. Kuiper. Kuiper. Yeah. So Kuiper is now, and the goal is 30,000? Yeah, yeah, so that's kind of cool. It is cool, right. but uh, but today we heard we will get internet into every part of the planet, which is missing. What is uh, Elon Musk doing? Yeah, well, right, Starlink. Yeah, right. so, uh, and uh, OneWeb is another company. Yeah, yeah. So again, it sounds like they are going to conquer. Well, they're and competing do it. in rockets, they might as well compete in satellites. Yeah. Sanjeev, yeah. thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. You. Such All a right, pleasure. keep it right there. We'll be back for SuperCloud 5. Jerry Chen is kind of is in the house. He's coming up shortly with John Furrier and myself. We're here in Las Vegas inside the sugarcane at the Emerald Lounge. We'll be right back.